Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever or wherever you are in the world. This is the Lightning Podcast, where we discuss and explore the weekly meditations without necessarily reaching any conclusions. I'm your host, Cyrus Polisbon, and I'm joined today by Harry Jacobs, Zohar Atkins, Nicholas Sarian, and a new guest, Jake Kozlowski, who is the founder and CEO of Keeper, an app where you'll find your soulmate on the first match. Welcome, Jake. Thank you, Cyrus. Great to be here. Today, we are covering a quote from a couple weeks back, actually, a few months back, in honor of Jake, in honor of Keeper, about love. And Harry, would you read it out for us? Yes. Uh, The quote is, to fall in love is to create a religion that has a fallible God. That's the quote. Religion, that's a fallible What do you... I don't want to put you right on the spot, Jake immediately but what do you think of that quote just surface level just yeah i i like it i think there's definitely truth in it when you fall in love and when you form a committed relationship you really are just shifting all the, the your baseline values and frameworks to be in a dyad and not either not alone or not in relationship with I, I don't want to say not in relationship with God because a lot of people have a relationship with God and their their spouse, but the, the sort of traditional order of values was God, family, and country, right? And so love and, and your partner often come in at number two after God. And for a lot of people who aren't necessarily religious, that maybe comes before God for a lot of people as well. So yeah, I think it's a great quote. I think also it's it, there's it reminds me of a quote that I heard I actually tweeted this a week or two ago, a Jordan Peterson quote where he said, marriage is the process by which sanity is created, meaning you basically, by committing yourself to someone else and being in a relationship, you force yourself to work through all your insanity, all of your defects and flaws and same with your partner. And I think people have a similar relationship with God in that way, that part of the purpose of religion. And so, yeah, having someone that you love can fill that role as well. Interesting. Zohar, you're married. What do you feel about this quote? Just a word of context. It's by Borges, for those who who wanted the reference. Mm -hmm. Borges was a man of great trickery. He's one of the the greats of auto fiction who creates labyrinths within labyrinths. And we have to first acknowledge the paradox in this quote, which is, a fallible God. So typically one defines God as infallible. In fact, in Catholicism, not only is God infallible, but the Pope is infallible. So to create a religion that has a fallible God is a bit of a mind bender. So first we need to understand what is a fallible God, what would be a God that could remain a God and still be fallible. And the second is to create a religion. Of course, if you're a secular person, you look at the history of religion and you think of prophets, much like today we think of founders as having invented religion. But classically, religion is something that emerges out of a revelation. It's not necessarily created so much as it is given or co-created. I want to emphasize the activity in that word, create a religion. And that's put in contrast to the passivity of the first word, which is falling. We almost don't notice it in our common speak until we speak about falling in love as this thing that you go through almost like a trauma, like a car accident or something. Like you trip into love. It's not a choice. And yet, and here again, I'll be curious to hear Jake's perspective as a, as someone who's created a dating app and, and is leveraging AI to, to form and direct human choice. But there is such a thing as being ready for marriage versus not ready, as well as the idea of being ready to not be ready or to not be ready to be ready. So maybe it's a two by two. So here I would say that if only it were so easy to fall in love, but many people who want to can't. Oh, and many people who don't want to or say they don't want to do. So how do we account for all of that? So I, I didn't answer the question from a personal perspective. I just threw more on the table. Yeah. 
if you want my personal take on this, to fall in love is to create a religion that has a fallible God, I would say that it has to do with commitment. Once you, once you make a commitment to something, it's no longer interesting whether that commitment is justified. Before you make a commitment, you're vetting that person to see, can I commit to them? However, once you make the commitment, you have to switch from basically, what's the word, interviewing them to now I'm going to do everything in my power to make this work because, because the commitment itself has created a new entity. And it's hard for those who haven't done this to really appreciate commitment because in the context of work, if you hire someone, you could fire them. And while you might feel bad about it, it's known by both parties that there's ultimately like a transaction here and it's ephemeral. Whereas when it comes to a romantic commitment, I know that divorce is common and is on the rise, but hopefully one goes in with the attitude that's a, an absolute worst case scenario, not just something that you're going to do the moment you get afraid. I think that in the context of interpersonal relations, the creation of a religion that has a fallible God means that in contrast to God who is infallible, your partner will have flaws just as you do, but your job isn't to point out their flaws and judge them or cancel the relationship because those things bother you, but instead to be devout regardless. I was just going to say, it reminds me of, we before the podcast started, just briefly mentioned Greek mythology. It reminds me of Greek mythology in that way where the gods were fallible and, and mm -hmm. had their flaws that were a core part of the myth as opposed to the more monotheistic religions. Yeah. That's like the key archetype, the key characteristic of them. They're messed up. <laughs> Zeus is lost and whatnot. Um, That's I want to ask Nico. Oh, I want to ask Nico, like he says it's, he doesn't just say to fall in love is to worship a fallible God. He says it's to create a religion around a fallible God. What ways, because I know you, Nico, teach a course right now, our first lightning course on, what is it? Religion and sacrifice, luxury and sacrifice, religion and economics. Religion and like, economics, yeah, from sacrifice uh, to luxury. Yeah. Um, do you think the, the wordplay of religion here has any double meaning or, or do you think it adds any meaning can we construe the old terms for religion um, and apply it to this quote um, i would say i think just borges is here using the term in the most like quotidian way like i don't think there's any semantic play here on the word religion like religion qua like we believe in god right so does that, but so religion implies like ritual and habit and practice. So I, I would say, I, let's say I'm down to do this, but we're going to totally diverge from talking about love <laughs> or maybe we will circle back to love, but I'm for this. So let's go. What do you mean by religion? What do you think by religion? What do you think is the meaning of religion? Harry, does. Harry, Harry, does. Harry yeah. <laughs> I may or may not be the guy to be on this podcast you are the guy but I'll... there's so many ghosts there's so many things <laughs> under the table here because we're talking about relationships and jake uh -huh. here is a, a he's creating an app so yeah i'm single <laughs> i but zohar is married harry i'm I, you know what i'm I, i'm gonna <laughs> there's a checkbox here on the podcast somewhere that says it's complicated and i check that box but i'll <laughs> i'll say two things one is i'm reminded of of the quote from Robin Williams in Goodwill Hunting when he's talking to, to, to Matt in, in his little office down mm -hmm. there. And he said the thing about love and what he loved about his partner, about his wife who has since passed, was all the little kind of picadillos, if you will, the peculiar, peculiar yeah. about her. And that's what you fall in love with someone. But to me, when I, when I read the quote, I thought one thing, and as I just for the ten minutes we've been here, I've thought to myself: people look at love and relationships as seeing the light, right? That's a descriptor. Sometimes when people fall in love, they go seeing the light. I know, I understand what the meaning of life is now. I'm meant to be to do this or to do that or whatever it is. I, I think it's easy to get caught in it, and the realization over time that you have you're following a fallible God, right? If that's 
how you're looking at it, but people get caught in that. I, I think we've all fallen head over heels in that way. And for a moment, I don't want to minimize religion, Zohar, but for a moment, that is your, it can be your God. It can be your thing. You're, you've seen the light. You've had, listen, it took me a, a long time to fall in love and to give myself to a relationship. And when I did, I thought I found something completely different in this world. And I don't know that is what this is, but to me, in my head, that's one of the things that, that came up. And there's nothing else you think about. No. I'm hesitant to talk about my personal story here because there's a lot of girls out there hearing, like listening to this podcast. That <laughs> Cyrus is going, Cyrus is going, more, Cyrus is going Mori Povich here. He wants the drama. He wants yeah. you to share, Nico. Give uh, us the details. Yeah, to, to, yeah, exactly. to like my like my street cred for. I'm not saying that the girls that I like want to go out are going to listen to this. I'm just talking about my. Sorry, my ex. <laughs> I, I believe you bring it. up a good point, though, because we're all men right now. So this right. is actually, this is men's view of love. Uh, this is any woman who's watching. I know there's a few female listeners. I've, I've talked to them. Welcome. Welcome to you. Ladies. Apologies. We should, have a, uh, we should have a hotline. So 800, like, lightning, com- lightning podcast. What do you think? <laughs> if, if, if I was as good looking as Cyrus, I'd be talking to them as well, too. No, geez. Listen, no. I'm remind- for Nico, I'm, I'm reminded of the great philosopher Julio Inglesis. To all the girls I've loved before. And with that, I think you should continue to share some of your Okay. Your tails. I, I want to go back to the quote. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to share, but we're not asking. No, no, it's not, it's not because of, I don't want to. I don't want to like not share like my private or personal life. It's just that it seems like a, it seems like so much. But I agree with what Harry said. We have Jake in the room, who is has an app that is meant to link people up, and so it's. I feel that what I'm going to say. I can talk about anything really at this point. <laughs> I can talk about religion. I can talk about love. I can talk about. Let me ask you all. Let me ask yeah. you all. Do you feel that this quote is a healthy way of looking at it? It, it may be true, but is it a healthy way to go about it? And what I'm do you mean by healthy? Let well, me weigh in. What you, let me weigh in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I I think that this is a cautionary description of love. Whether Borev intends it that way or not, this is how I, I, I read it as don't create a religion that has a fallible God. I know that contradicts what I said before, but rather um, have a realistic appraisal of what you're getting into. Don't set your, your expectations to be so unrealistic that you crash and burn. If you recognize that your partner is a human being rather than a God, then when they reveal that they're a human being, you won't have to write the relationship down to zero. And we're all fallible. And the purpose of a relationship is not to escape rea- reality, even though there's a certain incubation period in, in the early stages, the honeymoon period, so to say, where maybe you feel like you're floating and, and, and you're insulated against the world. But ultimately, the, the goal of a relationship is to live in the world. Um, maybe you have a little halo effect, um, but it's a modest one. It's a subtle one. It's not meant to be just a drug. I mean, the problem with overemphasis on love, and we actually conflated love, dating, and marriage here. He didn't say to marry is to create a religion. He said to love, to fall in love. So everyone here is like talking about their marital status and just pointing out like you read into this. It's like that meme on Twitter where they go, I, you know, I feel seen, um, I'm being attacked and it's no, you're not. Can I interrupt? Can I inter- interject something here? It's to your point. Let's say if, if love is to fall in love, no. What can, what things can we fall for? Because again, if we talk about love as in the, in the categorical sense, not as the love of one person or a couple or a partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. We can fall for a lot of. It almost sounds like a con, right? And and I, the great religious traditions would say we can fall for reality. And think that the world is real when actually it's an illusion. Uh, I was going to say, I was going to say the whole thing's a giant con, isn't it? In, in just, but the reality is you end up, I mean, everyone needs a little Zohar in their life. If nothing else, the, what you just said about all of this to me is a giant reality check for anyone in, in terms of love and marriage and all that stuff. Because who hasn't gotten caught up in 
in those initial moments of what that feels like. But the reality is that if that is your God, it is a fallible God, right? Sooner or later. Only God is God. Yes. But, but at the same time, and I, I was on a podcast some years ago discussing this with Sheila Hetty and, and some other writers. There's an amazing line at the end of a Woody Allen movie, Annie Hall, where Woody Allen's character says he's talking to his shrink and he says, my brother is crazy. And the shrink says, so why don't you turn him in? Like, why don't you send him to an institution? And he says, uh, he, he's crazy because he thinks he's a chicken. Why, why don't you turn him in? And the guy says, I would, but I need the eggs. <laughs> and, 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 and then, <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful and then this song. character like faces the camera and it's like Woody Allen as the character telling us, and this is how the whole movie ends. That's what love is. Uh, it's crazy. We get burned. We do the whole thing all over again. But what choice do we have? We need the eggs. And I think that, that points to the idea that like, okay, you might have a self-diagnosis that you're crazy, but that doesn't make you less crazy. And also, okay, fine. So you're crazy. No big deal. Like love is crazy. It's a little bit untethered. That's fine. Well, that could be some form of narcissism as well. It's also coming from Woody Allen as we're talking about fallible. So <laughs> don't get me started. That's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> I kind of add some, uh, bring some water to the middle here, because if I would have to give a definition of, of what is love in a philosophical way, like in the way that Borges is kind of perhaps hinting to, I would refer to Plato, because everybody, Plato, like, goes, if you want to talk about eros and love in a philosophical way, everything goes back to Plato, or at least because the symposium, no, one of the dialogues of Plato, which is perhaps the founding text of philosophy, if you will, as a, as a thing, deals with the nature of love, no? And in fact, the funny thing about philosophy is that philosophy is about love. There's a way of reading, like understanding philosophy is a... Love. Yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, but uh, what I would say when regards to Borges from a more contemporary uh, point of view is that you've had like people like Slavoj Žižek, Alain Badiou, like there has been a thing I've seen, even like Jean-Luc Marion, like just naming a few figures, contemporary philosophers, theologians, who have pointed out this kind of contemporary problem that in a sense points back to Plato because Plato talks about eros, about love as a, not as a, call it equidistant, asymmetrical endeavor, no? there It's much more contradictory, and asymmetrical eros, the way that eros works. Eros, I mean love, no? But the point is that already in Plato, you have this idea that to fall in love, it's to fall, no? It's to, as Zohar said earlier, to like to fall, uh, to stumble, no? It's something that is unprecedented, un unwarranted, unplanned, no? That's, the, the, let's say, the capacity to fall in love. But you have people today, like the Zizek, Badiou, and Marion saying today, like, Nobody falls in love because nobody wants like unwarranted, un, unsolicited, un, unplanned events in their life. Of course, I'm like, let's say making an absolute of the claim. But the idea is that to fall in love is almost like a tragedy <laughs> today because to really fall in love, no? I'm curious to see, to, uh, to hear what Jake thinks about this, given that it's, he's creating a market around this. <laughs> and the other thing is how does... How, with AI is taking over the world and you either embrace it and say, boy, I can augment whatever's going on in my life or with my company or whatever with AI, or you can run from it. I'm, I'm so curious to really get an understanding from Jake as to what role AI plays into helping us pick a partner. Honestly, you know, would I hand it all off to AI at this point and do a, you know, answer a questionnaire and let, you're probably going to do a better job than I've done in my 58 years on the planet, right? Talk, can talk us through that. What's that piece of it? Yeah, definitely. I, Nico, what you were saying about falling in love I, and it being unplanned, I guess my interpretation is similar, but maybe not exactly the same. I think a lot of young people today do want to fall in love and plan on falling in love and starting a family and getting married. Match Group, who owns you know, 75% of the dating app market does a survey every year. And last year's one showed that 80% of 
basically millennial and Gen Z do intend at some point to get married and start a family. In the literal sense, I think people are planning on it, but obviously it's not something you can choose. And so that's where I think the falling aspect comes in because as much as you might want to love someone, if you don't, you can't, you can't necessarily force yourself to, or at least to, fa to fall in love with someone in the romantic sense. So yeah, wh where AI comes in, Harry, is, is basically identifying who is the person out there that you have the highest probability of experiencing that and, and falling in love with. And my, my ideal for the future, they made a, a Black Mirror episode about this, actually. I don't know if you guys are fans. Season four, episode four, Hang the DJ. Great episode. One of the only utopian episodes because the episode was actually a critique of modern dating. And then at the end, it was like, but in the future, this is what dating will be like. And so the, the episode laid out basically people going on dates, date after date, and very meaningless. And there was uh, a lot of heartbreak. And then at the end, spoiler alert, you can pause here if you haven't watched it yet. <laughs> at the end, it's no, actually, this was an algorithm and this was a, a representation of what the algorithm is doing. But in real life, the app is just saying, okay, you've gone on these a thousand simulated dates and here is your, here's the person that you were most likely to fall in love with. Here's the person that you fell in love with in the simulation. And so you download this app. It says, okay, here's your soulmate. You meet them and you delete the app and then you live happily ever after, right? And so that that's the beautiful future that I envision. Obviously, you don't have to use it if you would rather wait and not whatever. People might want to get fall in love at different parts of their lives. But I, I think right now, in the younger generation, there, there's a very big gap where, you know, I, I, anecdotally, if you talk to people in New York City, for example, you'd be like, yeah, all of my friends are incredibly eligible, like very successful in great shape, wonderful people. And they're all single, even though they all don't want to be. And the data shows that's just happening at, a, at an incredibly massive scale. The, the projections have about 40% of young people actually getting married and starting a family, even though about 80% want to. And so I, I think the interesting question, and maybe Zizek is, is partly correct in this, that maybe people don't want that lack of control. I, I Maybe that's a piece of it. I, I think it's fairly multivariate, but it's like, why is that happening now when that didn't happen in previous generations? Our, our parents' generation, about 60, 70% of them got married. Their parents' generation, about 90% did. That's like the first time in history that this is happening. Marriage is cratering. Fertility rates are cratering as a result. And so that's, we're trying to solve it. I, I think I have hypotheses as to why it's happening, but it's a very complex picture. And I, I don't know that I have all the answers there. So how do, how do you take a guy like Nico, handsome, dazzling, <laughs> elegant, et cetera, so I can build the profile for Nico for you, but all kidding aside. I, I can tell you, you some stories and you're going to be totally deterred to go into this direction. Nico, I, I, talk, <laughs> I, I, I talk right now. I'm selling you. You just sit there and look cute. Just sit there and look cute. I'm talking to Jake. So Jake, how, kidding aside, how do you take someone like Nico or one of us and build that profile and then put it into your, and, and, and let the AI find the right person? Yeah, it really is as Without simple. Giving too much away. Yeah, it's as simple as just learning as much as we can about you. Though we've actually modeled this out and basically every additional preference and trait that we learn about you exponentially increases our odds of finding you a match. And, and it actually is the same, even in just regular dating, like for an individual, if the, the more vetting you do up front, basically, you will spend exponentially less time going on bad dates if your goal is love and marriage. So yeah, we learn as much as we can about you. So the, the beauty of designing an app is balancing, being able to capture all that info while keeping you engaged and excited and, and not getting bored and frustrated. It's certainly a challenge. It's something that we're always improving, but the way the AI works is it's fairly straightforward. Honestly, at this stage, you're representing all of your preferences to us. So a traditional dating app is going to capture maybe a dozen or so things. Hinge asks for about a dozen things, age, height, religion, politics, all the basics. In our view, those are necessary, but not sufficient because you're going to have, or everyone has, we have thousands and thousands of data points on this. Everyone has preferences that fall outside of those sort of basic things. And it's a very long tail because everyone's unique. And the beauty of human sexual selection is we, we've also sort of developed all these little things that we care about that other people don't necessarily care about. And so you, you use AI. The reason that AI makes this possible now is AI can analyze that long tail and say, whatever the thing is that you want, whether it's a physical preference or values or personality or, or anything, 
and then make a determination as to whether the other person has that trait. And if the AI doesn't know, it can have a conversation with that person and learn, basically ask the right set of questions to determine whether it has that they have that trait or look at photos of them or scrape their social media. There's a vision element as well as a language element. So it's essentially preference trait matching in that regard. And then the other component is trait to trait matching. So there's a lot of good research in, in um, the psychology side of things on which traits are most commonly uh, found in uh, successful married couples. Uh, so what traits they have in common, basically. IQ is an easy example, correlates extremely highly in married couples. You, you basically want to have a partner with similar IQ. People are more likely to fall in love with someone who's around the same range as that, or the range as them, excuse me. And so there's a number of traits like that, that you can also just measure. And so even if someone doesn't explicitly say, I'm super smart, I want someone who's super smart or, or, or the opposite, <laughs> or you can still make that assumption and, and make a better match for them than you would otherwise by measuring those sorts of things. Caveman seeking cave woman. Exactly, oh, yes. Boonga, boonga. We're, we're cornering the Neanderthal market. So, Har, you have something to say? I have a bunch. Of you have a questions. bunch to say. So, Nico mentioned before, I think this beautiful, like, koan of a question, which is, what else do we fall for or fall into? And another phrase that we frequently use is falling asleep. And falling asleep very, is a great, very similar processes. Is yeah. a great example of something that it requires a certain activity towards and habit towards. And yet the moment of falling asleep is actually a switching from effort to surrender. And just like with romance, there are people who have a difficult time falling asleep. And so my, if we accept the metaphor, all metaphors are limited, then the, just as a person can suffer from apnea, there could be a kind of romantic apnea. And I would say that this points to the core difference between falling asleep and falling in love, which is falling asleep is between you and your unconscious, whereas falling in love requires an actual other person. And so I'm curious what you think about this, but I'm just going to say it in, in a very provocative way because it's more fun. What if a lot of those people who say they want to fall in love uh, are not actually telling the truth to themselves? and they actually are incapable. And so no match is going to work because it's not about preferences. That is just a, a superficial way of deflecting from the apnea. Or maybe they could go on a first and second date, but they don't want to go on a third and fourth date. And so the deeper issue is people need commitment coaching or relationship coaching rather than just finding the person whose traits match the traits. I, I want to add something onto that before you answer, Jake. A, sure. a lot of people are in love with the idea of falling in love, right? Definitely. They think, the Zohar's point, I think, the appeal of it. But as a man, we're all men. You have to be capable of doing what it takes, right? To really, it's one thing to be in love like some people think, but to really make it work. You must be capable. You must be present. You must be willing to, what's the fall exercise in a sense? You must be willing to let it go and be open to be vulnerable to do all those things that that a, a true relationship requires, right? It's Definitely. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I, I think, I guess my reaction to that is, is, you know, the best way to learn is by doing, right? So I wouldn't encourage people to not, love the idea of falling in love. I think it's a beautiful thing and you should. It's a great goal. I think to your point, Harry, not everyone has either the experience or the maturity to handle a relationship and so whether that's seeking counseling, like coaching or or just going for it and learning as you go, but making sure you're doing it with the right person so that you can grow together in that way. A lot of the most beautiful marriages that I've seen, they met in high school or, or college and they, they started at a really young age, but they made that commitment to each other and then grew together. And I think those are some of the deepest relationships that exist on this earth. Yeah, it's Zohar, to your point. So I love the sleep analogy. I, I've used this I, I've used this in the past. It's a really awesome analogy. I think you... So a, apnea is one way to, to compare it. I think insomnia is another. I, I guess I think of apnea as once you're in the relationship, how well do you maintain it versus do you overanalyze it to the point where you drive yourself 
neurotic and you're not able to actually fall in love. And I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people today, I, I think, have the insomnia and, and a lot have the apnea. I, I think they're both distinct issues. And yeah, there, there's a huge role for counseling. There's a huge role for coaching. There's a huge role for a lot of things, like even stylists and personal trainers and nutritionists. The keeper's goal is to help people go from zero to in a successful, committed relationship. And so matchmaking is a huge part of that. But you certainly have people who are probably not ready to be in a match yet and they need help on the other stuff. So we do help with that stuff. We have a, an, actually an AI dating coach uh, as well as human dating coaches that we offer. We, if, so if someone gets rejected for a, a reason that's actionable, right? what we'll say is, hey, we had your dream girl. She met everything you told us you wanted, but she didn't like this thing about you. And actually you can go fix that thing. So you should go fix it. <laughs> and we, we give that feedback for free. Now we tested at one point selling it and every, every single guy paid for it. You want to know why your dream girl rejected you. So yeah, there's a role for all of this stuff. I think historically when we lived in smaller communities like tribes or, or villages throughout human history, this there was more of an active role where like your grandmother would give you this feedback or your religious leader, your family, your close friends, because everyone really had a stake in your success when it came to relationships. But as we've become more atomized, I think a lot of people have lost that feedback loop. And so there is a need for it to be filled probably with technology today. I have one other follow-up question before Nico gets in on the action, which is we've spoken before about Rene Girard and the medic th theory of desire, which is that people like what other people like. And this is an obvious uh, facet in, in, in the realm of physical attraction. Why do we desire the co proverbial we blondes or thin people or something like this? I'm sure a certain percentage of that is not innate but just because that's what society has decided. And we do that to ourselves as well in terms of wanting to be an attractive mate. You cultivate certain traits, not necessarily because they represent your own authentic view of how you want to appear, but because you want to appear like the kind of person that can be desired by a counterparty. And when what that does, I think, is it creates a certain culture of conformity and competition and also, therefore, an anxiety of how you measure up. And competition is a force that makes the world go around. And it's why people are always breaking world records. But I think there's something potentially unhealthy about that as well, where you are disassociated from your truth and you love the other person for external reasons, regarding them as like a trophy or a prize that you won in some kind of tournament. Instead of going to this deeper place of what is the thing, like Kevin Kelly says, don't be the best, be the only. What is the thing that makes me the only? And what is the thing that makes my partner the only? And how can I appreciate them and they appreciate me for that onlyness as opposed to for, I love you because you're five IQ points smarter than the next guy or your six pack is um, that much more toned than the next person or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? It's, I do think a lot of interesting thing about human behavior when it comes to dating is, at least in my experience, it, it, it seems like it violates a lot of sort of the general trends that you see in social psychology. Not to say that mimetic theory doesn't play a role, but for, for stuff like express versus revealed preferences, the, the data actually is pretty interesting that like pe people's expressed and revealed preferences are actually pretty close in, in this particular domain. And I think part of that is that there's just so much evolutionary pressure to basically have these things be accurate and to be conscious of them because the more accurate they are and the more conscious you are of them, the more likely you're going to be to, to successfully reproduce. And so it's just the definition of, of evolution said, would I advocate anyone to not be true to themselves? Definitely not. I, I think you, you, you're right. Like the opt, I, I actually do think the optimal strategy is to be the, to identify your competitive advantage, like you said, and, and double down on that and go all in on that because there will be someone out there who has, who is the perfect fit for whatever your thing is. I think I mentioned this, but we, the long tail for what people care about is so long. People really are like very unique puzzle pieces. And that's the beauty of the approach that we're doing is you can identify who is that random person in all of America who happens to have the exact thing that you're looking for and, and vice versa. But at the same time, short-term attraction does matter to getting to long-term attraction 
know, there's been a lot of apps that have tried to ignore short-term attraction and it's just like text only and it's just person about personality, but it's not, that's not how we're wired. You can't, you can't ignore that element either. So yeah, I, I think the truth mm-hmm. is in the middle. Harry, you have something to say? It was the, I keep going back to Sorry, Nico, Nico did too. Nico okay. after you. Oh, look, he's got a list. I don't have a list. <laughs> he's got I don't a, have list. a list. I, listen, I was just going to say, I was going to quote Pete Townsend, right? It's the eminence front, right? It's a put on. We have this thing that we do from what Zohar said. It's our competition in a way, or maybe you, you said that. But to that point, you build yourself up as perhaps something that maybe really you're not. It's part of the competition to sell yourself, to be able to get that guy or that girl or whatever. What steps are there in place to stop someone from lying? Can the AI detect, oh, these aren't really your interests now, are they? Like you don't yeah. really enjoy going to the beach. You want to stay at home <laughs> and read your book. You should try and fix Instagram for that first. Yeah. One other question, which is like the figuring out that someone's deceitful at level one is in a way easier than figuring out that they're deceitful at like level five or six. So for example, if somebody is like a manipulative narcissist, it might be very difficult for the AI to figure that one out. And so is is the view that there's someone for everyone. So just find the person that fits that puzzle piece who's, oh, I love being manipulated by a narcissist. Or or is it just like uh, some people have to get thrown out because like it would actually be like a disservice, so to say, if we were to pair them off with someone. Yep, that's that's a great question. We've debated this internally in the past. Yeah, there's a classic narcissist empath (laughs) romantic couple that does exist, or you could put the narcissist with each other. So yeah, our approach right now, we do remove people if we catch them being dishonest. Basically, we we give them a warning the first time and then the second time we, Mm -hmm. we kick them out. And if we catch them being dishonest, we mark that against them. Even if we don't kick them out, we'll mm. just be a lot more careful. <laughs> they don't, get a, ro- they don't, get, they don't yeah. get a rose. They get voted off the island, whatever your mechanic is. Yeah, exactly. Sticking a um, literal red flag. Yeah. I, the most common ones tend to just be age and height. Got guys, older guys and shorter guys lying about that stuff. We've had more issues with men lying than women so far. I don't know if that'll hold up. Uh, as we grow, but yeah, it is a, it's a big problem. It's not a big problem for us today, but it will be in the long run. Uh, it's happened a few times so far. I think as our user base becomes more the, the general population and not the initial networks and word of mouth communities that we've started with, who just tend to be higher trust, that'll change. There are ways you can mitigate it. Our AI can scan your social media, for example, and, and there's just a tremendous amount of information that a lot of people have out there that it can make judgments based on and the extent to which your Twitter and Instagram and, and are sort of in direct conflict with one another, right? If you're posting photos, being at the club all the time, but you're talking about your 8 p.m. bedtime or something, like it, it could flag whatever. That's it's a silly example, but it, it can flag it can flag contradictions. It can flag things that, you know, like fraud detection in fintech, you basically have ML models that can detect anomalies, right? The other thing you can do, so when it comes to like dark triad psychology, there are so there are ways to measure that basically. The big five personality test is the main personality test that psychologists use, it's the most scientifically rigorous equivalent of Myers-Briggs or Enneagram, if you guys know, those are the more pop psych versions. Like be, being a sociopath, for example, correlates quite highly with having certain big five traits. And so you can build big five tests that are pretty hard to game and that can detect whether the user is gaming them. And then you you can make assumptions based on those results. So there are ways to test for these things. This is more in the distant future for us. It's not our biggest problem today to solve, but we've thought about it. We've thought about it a bit. Yeah. So I didn't want to put you on the spot. I was just really curious. Nico, you have a lot to say. You have your whole list. You checked it twice. Yeah, please tell us. I, I'm just gonna. I, I think it's questions, but I have basically a biopolitical critique of this whole thing. Zohar is not, knows what I'm talking about, but let me just ask you one thing to go back. You mentioned that episode from Black Mirror. I remember that episode, where basically what happens is that some sort of a- AI simulation avatar of a person is created, right, through the app, and those simulations date each other to the point where they will reach a match. And that person, not the avatar, will be shown the match. And what I see there is one thing, 
when it comes to, let's say, meeting another person, that, that app in Black Mirror is aimed at reducing the contingency of everything. So if there wasn't any app, that person would have to go all of that through all of that process that the avatar went through. Which and is what people are doing today. Without the apps, or let's say, pre presumably without the apps. No, with the current dating app. With, so the current dating well, apps do that. People, no, the current dating app, the current dating apps do not do what the Black Mirror. The, the current yeah. dating apps are built for, are, are not built for solving this problem for people. Yeah, okay. their, their incentive structures are, are broken. Right, but but there is, let's say, with all of this, let's say, a classification of, let's say, this transparency of the person. No, this idea of that the person can be transparent and that you can reproduce that person through algorithm or through data. No? Re re represent them. Yeah. 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 I, I just want to see what's the, what are the absolute claims of this? Because yeah, the, yeah. the problem that I see is that, and look, like I'm not trying to like, no, give no, you a critique I'm, of anything. I'm, I'm open. I love healthy. <laughs> okay. Because if I, let's say, if you look at the history of the institution of engagement between a man and a woman, or let's say whatever, given today's zeitgeist. What I see is that the way that we conceive love today, like falling in love and all of these things we were talking about, is really a son or it's a, it's a child of 19th century romanticism, like classical Goethe, Werther, falling in love, Romeo, Romeo and Juliet. That's, it's like this absolute, there's this kind of absolute engagement with the other person that defines everything. When, yeah. in fact, before that, marriage was not that. Marriage was a political institution, an economic institution whether it was not about the fact that this person would check in all of the boxes, right? You would sure. marry and you would, let's say, yeah, it's, it's my wife, but it's not the love of my life and like the reason for my existence and all of this. Uh, it's not BS. I don't know what to call it, but so I think that we're the drive, sorry. I think we're learning your views. I think yeah. we're learning your views. And no, this is just like stuff that I've studied and it's a way that I see this. If anything, I'm a victim of all of this, call it historical. But the, the point, the problem that I see with, let's say, the, like, I don't know, I, maybe someday we will go back to those forms, who knows? But there seems to be some sort of disease of misunderstanding what marriage is, no? Or what the, our inheritance of that institution has been, because... Everybody will say that marriage is a failed institution, but I think it's because we had this romantic stage in the middle that got rid of the institution. And now we think of the partner, the other person as this absolute, this kind of, if you will, Aristophanic, like my other half, this completion thing, no? When in fact, you don't have to go back to the Greeks. You can just go back to the 18th century and see how marriage worked there. It's like, yeah, it wasn't like that big of a deal. It was a big of a deal when it came to, when it came to economics making strategic alliances and all of these things. But it was that had, had this existential, if you will, philosophic uh, element to, to life, or completing life in itself. And what I see as, a, let's say, the ultimate outcome of that today, and this would be, if you will, like the biopolitical, whatever, critique, is that the apps, this idea of representing the person, which, as you pointed out, it's impossible to do that, no? Uh, you think it's possible? You can get close. I, I think it's an asymptote, right? Okay. You're, you're, you're never going to get to 100%. But fine, can... fine. But my, my point there is that the problem of, let's say, that is that it's a, it's a further step in that romantic, if you will, pulsion. Because it means that in order for to you to assure the, the match or, let's say, the, the completion of oneself with another person, you need to know who the other person is to the core, like to the bone, without, let's say, with almost like surveilling, like the, the total transparency of who this person is. Right. And the problem that I see with this, and this has nothing to do with dating apps. This has happened to me personally, like going on dates, like in the past few years, that I think that a lot of the times we do not, this is in vogue today, but it, today it seems that either we do not know the full story on what goes on, at, say a person's day to day or their past history. and we, we perhaps grow up with this idea that life is in a certain way for everybody and we don't see the dark parts. But today, that doesn't go, it's effed up if, you, if you're we're aiming for transparency. So much Just transparency like, might lead to showing you that it's way more complicated and dark than that it, that it seems, no? Uh, 
I'm not, I'm not trying to, to to paint a black picture of like our reality, but it's yeah. I, I, I want to answer you, Nico. So let me yeah. take that last point, and then I'll and then I'll go back to something else you said. Nothing is simple. Uh, I don't think a word or a phrase or a concept has a one to one meeting. Like saying I'm I I was a victim of such and such is, is meaningless without the interpretation of how do I relate to that and what meaning have I assigned to that in my story and how, how alive for me is it? So I think that the more salient thing is, does the person have a victim mentality and walking around with an actual PTSD or an actual trauma or just a sense of sort of negativity as a result of this, a, a sense of doom or low agency? Those are the things you do want to capture because there is a fit for that person, but it's not going to be every person. Or is it just, hey, I want you to know that I, I've been through some hard things, but I'm stronger as a result. I'm more resilient, et cetera. That's a completely different narrative. The same facts could have happened to two different people. And one is I'm stronger for it. And one is I'm telling you on the second date I'm traumatized because I don't have a therapist or I do, but I'm just telling everyone because I'm not worked out or whatever it is. Like, I think you need to get into the why, not into the facts. So I agree with Jake that if we can actually disambiguate the, those superficial things and get into the deeper aspect of why is the person saying that to you, what do they want you to take from it, then that will actually filter out for the person who has the ability to handle it or even appreciate it. You, one person calls it dark, another person finds light in it and says, oh, I've also been through hard times and I get that and I'm in it with you. You know what I mean? So that's on that point. But then on your historical point about the 19th century emphasizing romance and that being new and perhaps an ideology or an illusion or something and, and one that you're victim to, I don't entirely agree. I think there's always been romance. It's just that some people have been blessed to experience that as part of marriage and some people have found it outside of marriage and separated the utility of marriage into, let's say, the economic arrangement or the reproductive arrangement and then sought romance elsewhere. Sometimes they didn't even find romance sexually. They sought it in the form of homosocial friendship or something like that. Because I think a huge part of this romance thing is just people feeling lonely and wanting to feel connected, wanting to see and be seen. That has always been there. The Bible says Isaac loved his wife, Sarah. Isaac loved his wife, Rebecca. It doesn't say Abraham loved his wife, Sarah, and it doesn't say Adam loved his wife, Eve. It says Adam knew his wife, Eve. It says about Jacob that he loved Rachel. It specifically doesn't say that he loved the other wife, Leah. So we know that not all marriages had love in them, but that doesn't mean that people didn't want loving marriage. It just means not everybody was blessed to get it and that the reason people got married was distinct from what we're talking about, which is like the love feeling that, that Borjas is capturing. And my last point on this is if you look at medieval Jewish commentators, and I'm sure you can find some more things in Christianity, on Genesis, there's actually the, the Bible says we should be fruitful and multiply, which is an obligation to reproduce. The commentators emphasize that there's a separate mar separate obligation to be married separate from that. For example, if a man already had children and then his wife died or vice versa, according to Maimonides, they should still be married. They should even get remarried because of the line in Genesis that says it's not good for man to be alone. The problem is that we actually marriage or relationships take a bunch of different needs and bring them all together. It's part of the bundling, right? New York Times gives you editorial news, <laughs> obituaries, classifieds, and now we're in the great unbundling. So you can see that marriage similarly has been unbundled into all the different things. You get Tinder for a one night stand and something else for the other, whatever other aspects. And <clears throat> marriage, the core reason to be married, according to Maimonides, so this contradicts your point, is because the other person provides friction and it is good for human beings to experience limits to their will and their view of reality because we live in a state of delusion and we need other people to call our bullshit and force us to recognize that there's another will out there besides our own. So it's a corrective to narcissism. We might fail to get that corrective, but that's the reason to be in relationship separate from whether it leads to any kind of external utility.
you want to call that love or not that i don't know i don't think that's not the fu warm fuzzy feeling that's like level two or three but maybe you, you need those uh, you need the feelings of the first date the warm fuzzies so that you can then <laughs> open yourself up to getting wrecked yeah i think that's exactly right i think you nailed it yeah i think, agree i think we close on that does anyone have any other closing comments is this where I uh, book an appointment with Zohar, like a one-on-one yeah. -on -one, uh, appointment to, to fix the bullshit? Otherwise, you can come to me and I will ruin your life for a premium, for a premium customer, so get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen. Click the link in our bio. Yeah. It was, a, it was a genuine pleasure. Guys, viewers listening, you can continue the discussion on our Chronicles WhatsApp group. Its link is in the bio and you can also find Keepers info down in the bio, the app that Jake's created. If you want to try it out, give the algorithm a chance. Maybe it'll find you the partner that's right for you. Alrighty guys, have a good one. <laughs>